I'm going to talk about computer games, and I'm going to talk about what happens if you, in a computer game, if you give people the ability uh, to be who they want to be. I may want to be a really evil, vicious, nasty individual, I may want to be wonderfully good. And that's what we're going to talk about. We look at a little bit of data from those games and a few surprising results. I've always been fascinated about who I am. And as a kid and as a teenager, I, you know, I took IQ tests. I took um, the Hello Magazine Hot or Not test <laughs> just to find out who the hell I really was. When I was lucky enough to uh, become in, uh, you know, a computer games designer, I remembered this. And I thought this one question, you know what? In entertainment, so often I'm asked to empathize with the good guy. Personally, I empathize with the bad guy. I always think in James Bond movies, you know, that poor evil dude who set up his, his base in some volcano, I mean, the employment problems he must have to get staff must be terrible. So I, I always empathize with those, the bad guy. I always thought it was poor that James Bond came along, pressed one button, the whole base blew up. And so I went about thinking about how we could weave that into a computer game. And I designed a game called Black and White. And Black and White allows you the pl to play the role of a god. Now, what sort of god are you going to be? Are you going to be a wonderful, understanding god, listening to all the prayers of your little people, helping save as many lives as you like? Or, if you're like me, are you going to be the evilest, vicious, horriblest god? If someone asks a prayer of you, do you just splat them? I mean, you know. Who are they to ask you anything? And that's what this game allowed you to do. The interesting thing is what it did was it showed and reflected what sort of player you were in the visuals of the world. So if someone was playing the game and they were being a good god, the sky would be blue and the landscape would be green and lush and all the little tiny people would all be happy. And if you're an evil god... Um, the sky would be red and scary and all the little people would be um, really unhappy and sad. And this also went through into this creature you taught because it wasn't just the moral aspects of um, the world that you were playing in, but it also was fascinating is if I was able to give a games player something to look after, something to nurture, something that they could teach what was right and wrong to, that would also be an interesting fact. And so you were able to look after this creature and teach this creature what was good and what was bad by the way you played. That means you could make creatures that went around and killed the little people or went around and saved the people. Now, the interesting thing, neither of, this, neither of these two scales, the really good or the really evil or anything in between, was um, made, the, uh, made it that the game could be won more. So... It was completely up to you. You still could get to the end of the game with being good or evil. Now let's look at some of the results from this. Back in the day, this was in the early 2000s, we didn't have big analytical data, but we could look at the forums and we could look at the way people played, and some very interesting <laughs> things happened. 50% of the people who played black and white did as much good as they possibly could. Every challenge that they were faced they approached it in good. Every prayer they answered, they approached it in good. Only 10% of those people were evil. They did the opposite of the good, and they were unbelievably evil. When it came to the creatures, 65% of people brought their creatures up and brought them up with all the good morals. Even though, remember this is a game. Remember this is a game which you can escape into. Remember this is a game which you can you can enact out the fantasies that you want without any moral consequences in the real world. So I became fascinated in this. So fascinated, when it came to my next game, a game called Fable, I, I, I thought, well, let, let's take that. Rather than you being a god and playing a god, maybe that was too big a thing to give people. What will they allow in Fable is a, uh, allow a person to be just a person, a player to be just a person. What sort of person are you going to be in this world? What sort of hero are you going to be? Again, are you going to be a really wonderful hero, or are you going to be a really evil hero? 
and will have the world react to what sort of person you are. Again, was fascinating results. Again, we morphed and changed and reflected on a gradual scale what people looked like in the game, depending on how they acted in the game. And again, the results were absolutely fascinating. But we also introduced one new thing there. We introduced this idea of you caring for something. Because if I wanted to get to the real root of people's emotions, I had to give them something to care about and something to sacrifice. So in Fable, you had a dog. And this dog followed you around, and you could teach this dog what was right and what was wrong, and what to growl at and what not to growl at. And this dog, and this is key, unconditionally loved you. It didn't matter how evil you were, they unconditionally loved you. And so in the game, it was really fascinating to us when we posed this, this question at the final point of the game. Are you going to, A, save your dog? Your dog is going to die, you can save him. Or are you going to, B, kill your dog, have your dog, your dog's going to die, but you're going to get a million gold, more wealth in the game than you can possibly imagine? Or are you, C, going to save 5,000 strangers? And that was a real interesting moral choice that we asked people. Now, let's just ask people in this audience, how many people would save their dog and let 5,000 people die? There's a few of you, yeah. <laughs> how many people here would take the million pounds and let the 5,000 people die? Well, firstly, I don't believe you. <laughs> but, but, but secondly, you know, untold wealth is an Australia. Now, how many people would just wonderfully save the 5,000 people? Look at you. You're all wonderful people. Okay, let's have a look at the results. Um, actually, uh, if you look at the character, 70% of people just couldn't bring themselves to be evil. They just couldn't bring themselves to be evil. And again, that tiny sliver, 10%, enacted out their fantasies and, uh, and uh, were allowed to be evil. And remember, the game didn't reward you for being good or evil. It's just who you were. But the final choice was where the interesting stuff came. 65% of people, there are millions of people, 10 million people played this, played this game, 65% of those people let 5,000 people die just to save a dog. They could have just walked and got another dog. And that, what we discovered is people will all... That was an evil thing to do in the game, by the way, save your dog and let 5,000 people die. That was the most evil thing, because it was such a, such a selfish thing uh, to do. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, as I said, that was a, a, a fascinating insight. So when we went on to design another game, I wondered this. Well, you know... It's all right about individuals. It's all right for individuals to have this moral choice and what happens when you present this moral choice. But what if we present this into communities? And what we, if we present this into communities that can have a simple task to do together? And so, oh, oh I've got this one more thing to talk about, by the way. There is a cultural difference between Americans and British people. <laughs> Let's have a look at that. In America, 80% of people just cannot, they didn't even experiment with being evil. And 60% of, uh, only 60% of people saved uh, the dog in the final choice. Look at us British. We, we experimented far more with that evil. Now, I think that's not because we're intrinsically more evil. I don't think we are. I think we're more in touch with our emotions. It's interesting from the last speaker, there's a lot of talk about stress and a lot of talk about anxiety and, and addiction. I think the, I would say that the English are freer than the Americans. They're more constrained in their social boundaries. Let's move on to uh, the next, the global choice. I created this really weird experiment. And this weird experiment was this. I, I, on my mobile device, I let people have this cube. And I simply said to the world, inside this cube is a wonderful mystery. All of you have to work together to tap away at bits of this cube. 
So every, you could tap away and it would chip away a tiny bit of this cube. To get to the center of the cube, there needed to be 50 billion taps. That's 50 billion things. Now, that's what I, and I wonder, I ask myself the question, is curiosity enough, a strong enough motivator to people to get them to do this? Well, the results were fascinating. I had no idea that actually what people ended up doing is trying to get to the middle and working together. Some people worked 10 hours a day for three months, every single day, tapping to get to the, what, the mystery of what's inside the queue. But what was more fascinating was these pictures. <laughs> these pictures started to appear where people tapped away the side of the cube in, in a certain picture. And these, initially, it was penises. I think if we put a whiteboard on the wall and left it there for anybody to walk past, they'd probably draw a penis because, you know, it's just who we are. But then, after a little while, there were these groups of people. It's unbelievable. These groups of people that would go on every day and turn the penises into palm trees. <laughs> Um, which was, a, a, you know, a fascinating way of, this, of, of so society coming together and trying to solve it. We actually had on the side of this cube, just by people tapping away on the side of this cube, we actually had seven marriage proposals. Now, if you can imagine, well, I don't know how those marriages still exist today, but if you can imagine the tedium of tapping away something, please marry me, in the hope that the thousands of other people also tapping aren't going to change your message into, please leave me rather than please marry me. That was an enormous stretch. We had two obituaries. And most incredibly of all, we had the retelling of 9-11. We, someone drew a skyscraper, then someone else tapped away the shapes of a plane, then someone else tapped people falling out of a building, then someone else ta tapped, a, you know, America will be strong. It was an incredible event, and none of this was expected. What people did do is start to police the cube. There were these messages underneath these penises, you know, you are better than this. It was a fascinating thing. And indeed, if you look at the number of people uh, that played for more four hours, obviously a lot of people only played for less than an hour, but a lot of people played every <coughs> single day just to get to the centre of that mystery. And then we come on to my latest game, and perhaps the most interesting of all, because I really want to continue experimenting with what happens if you give people the ability to experiment with their morality. On the trail, you're exploring this vast continent altogether, and everyone you see is another person exploring it. What happens when, for example, on the picture on the, uh, on the left, what happens if you're walking along and you collapse? What are the people who are walking behind you going to do? And we found some fascinating results, which I'll share you um, in a second. So you're collapsing, and there's someone coming to behind you. They're going to steal your stuff, or are they going to help you out? Fascinating results. And the last thing we also experimented is what happens if you put people together in a community and allow them to share resources? Will they be greedy and selfish, or will they share things together and, and try and come together as a, uh, as a community. And what we found was that a lot of people steal once, but only once. A lot of people experiment. This is less about good or evil, and it's more about sharing. Some people often steal, and some people never steal. Very few people, relatively, 15% never steal. The concept of stealing from someone who's collapsed on the side is not there. And then if we look at players cooperating, 42% cooperate together in these towns. It's a fascinating insight to individuals and to groups of people. So in conclusion, I believe, and this is a wonderful thing, people are overwhelmingly good. In fact, as a games designer, they're depressingly good. No matter how much I, I tempt them with being nasty and vicious and evil and stealing things and robbing things and being vicious, many, many people, the vast majority of people, never even will go down that avenue. That is a truly fascinating thing. 
Culture is a big influence or a moral compass. If you look at those results, if we had time, I'd show you the results from other countries around the world. Germany, they, they experiment a lot with their inner evil self compared to the UK, compared to, uh, to America. Uh, it's a truly interesting insight. And I also believe if we continue giving people the ability to play around with what is mo morally right and morally wrong in a safe environment, what together, amazing results can come of that. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.